is a simple diagram to explain this. Safety means there are no immediate threats, okay? When we're safe, we exist in what's called our parasympathetic nervous system, which is a big word for business as usual. We'll get to what that means. When, we're, when there's a threat, because we can't guarantee a safe environment, when a threat comes along, a dog runs in the room, or, or uh, my job's on the line, or my relationship's in trouble, or I've just been divorced, or a threat to our sense of belonging, or a threat to our um, survival, you know, money, jobs, etc. These are threatening, naturally. And if it's a sudden threat, we'll rush quickly, instantaneously into our fight flight system, our sympathetic nervous system, which gears us up to deal with threat by either fleeing from it, the flight part, so avoidance, or fight, which is dealing with the threat to negate the dangers. Okay, And this happens automatically. You can't turn this off or on. It's like somebody coming and popping a balloon behind you. You will jump. Okay, And as you jump, you will turn towards the noise. So you risk assess. And this happens in a split second. That's great. This keeps us going. However, here's the problem. When we go to this sympathetic nervous system, our fight flight system, the activities, the physiological and mental activities that are normally on, that are, they will turn off if they're not directly engaged in dealing with that threat. So, here's an example. If there was a bomb outside and there was a massive explosion, I might jump, okay? I would jump and I'd think, wow, what happened? I might ring the emergency service, whatever. I then want to look. I want to see where the threat is so I can feel safe. As I, as I, as I look outside, I see that there are people injured because there's been a plane crash. Okay, I know this is a fanciful story. So I might run outside to help, okay? Most people will. There are conditions whereby where people won't. They might go to the freeze response, which I'll get to. But I run outside and it's a cold day and as I run outside, there are people injured. I wouldn't feel the cold. I might be hungry as that explosion happens and I run outside, my hunger's gone. These are all part of business as usual. Um, I might be thirsty when well, my thirst goes. I might be upset about something. I might be in an argument with somebody and I'm angry. Okay, and as I run outside, where's my anger? I don't feel angry anymore. I pick up something and it gashes my arm. I don't feel the pain. So the fight flight system is wonderful because it gears us for survival. Now let's say I'm out there and thus turning off other, other things. I won't also think about anything except the situation at hand. So I've got adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol running through me. So I'm now dealing with that situation and I've calmed down. I'm not shaky anymore like I was at the start because the adrenaline burns off quickly. And now I'm in a focused state of laser sharp focus. I remember how to do CPR. I remember how to do some bandaging. We connect with other people and we're bonded. And we're tribal now, and we're helping. We're in the zone. Okay, this is a good place. So I'm now helping. 15 hours, the ambulance finally gets there for some reason. They couldn't get there. I don't know, I'm making this story up. Um, so now, after 15 hours, I'm calm. I'm holding pressure on a wound. I'm talking to somebody. I'm like James Bond down there. You know, I'm cool, calm and collected. The ambulance says, right, you can go. Taps you on the shoulder. I stand up to walk away. I'm walking back to the car. The shaking starts, the breathing starts. I might burst into tears, that's a very common response, okay? The tears, this is called the parasympathetic rebound effect. This happens after extended periods in our fight flight. The journey back to safety is not an easy one. It's rocky for everyone. So when I'm going back, what's happened is all of those things that I thought had turned off, they don't. They're out of my conscious awareness. So suddenly they all hit like a truck and I get bowled over. That's when the shock kicks in and you kind of go, whoa, I've now got images that I've got to process. I've got emotions. I'm angry that the ambulance took so long. I'm now really hungry. My arm's throbbing. I'm exceedingly tired. When I get home, I might still be a bit in the fight flight to varying degrees and everybody's different. And I might be a bit, Quick to react, hyper-reactive to, to, you know, my partner or kids or something like that. They go, hey, Dan, oh, well done. Oh, I don't want to talk about it. 
there's some stuff there that I might want to avoid or stuff that is actually pushed into the unconscious because it's too graphic or it's too dangerous. I might feel incredibly guilty about somebody dying or somebody that I couldn't help. I might be ashamed of myself because, let's face it, business as usual, people get, with sudden shock and real terror can lose control of their bladder, for instance. So I now think I'm so embarrassed, feeling deeply guilty, embarrassed, ashamed of myself for all sorts of things. I've got to process all that. Now emotions are potent. We need emotions to be, we need to be conscious of our emotions in order to process them. If they're buried, they don't change. They stay as, a, as an unprocessed emotion. And, and you can walk around not knowing that you're, in ang you're, you're angry about something. We can all do that. And then suddenly we might fly off the handle for a small incursion or a small problem with somebody. Wow, where'd that come from? So we're now processing a lot. And that might take a few days. You might sleep really well for a period of time as we push ourselves into deep sleep. The other thing I did mention is when we're here, our immune system is compromised. We don't heal well. So the T cells and B cells and all of those things, the immune system responses aren't working well. So extended periods in our fight flight where there is a consistent threat means that going back to the norm, going back to safety can be a very difficult experience. That's very normal, it happens to everybody, to varying degrees, okay? Trauma, distress, doesn't happen during the emergency time, it happens afterwards. That's when the trauma kicks in. So now we think, oh no, I'm going mad because I'm not coping well and my thoughts are all muddled and I can't focus and I'm not feeling that I can nurture well. So our frontal lobe is a bit offline for a little while and there's nine functions of our frontal lobe according to a lot of research. And some of those include emotional regulation. Now, I'm not regulating my emotions well. Another one is empathy. We learn empathy, we develop empathy throughout our lifetime, okay? We're not born with it. So we're developing empathy, but in times like this, my frontal lobe isn't working well. Well, afterwards, if I'm still in my fight flight system, some of those normal uh, functions that we take for granted, like empathy, like fear modulation, like insight, like intuition, morality, and emotional regulation. These things can be impaired. So for a time there, we're not quite feeling ourselves. We haven't got the resources. If we think about this in terms of being in lockdown, working from home with the ever-present threat of not just COVID, but the loss of people we've loved, the inability to catch up with people that we care about in order to feel safe again, um, isolation, not belonging. This might have kept us all functional, but as people move back into a life that they consider should feel safe, they might say, whoa, what's just happened? I feel a bit on edge. This is the anxiety that might be confronting a lot of people is going back to work, is the parasympathetic rebound effect, where people are going, how come I'm so anxious about going back into an environment that I used to find easy, that I used to find pleasurable? And that is very much about going back into the tribe, into the work tribe, into the social situations, into small talk, and all of those things that we used to take for granted. Well, they might be difficult for people at the moment. And I hope that makes sense, that that is a difficult transition. And we're going to see a lot of people, and I know, I know, you know, Children have, have found it hard. There's 100,000 kids I've heard, you know, 100,000 kids who haven't gone back to school because they're too anxious or they don't want to. And a lot of that is, I don't think I can do it anymore. Yeah? And, and that's quite confronting. So, that's the physiology of it. I should just finish by, if that, just out of interest, I think, if the threat becomes so insurmountable that you can't flee, you can't get away from it, and there's nothing you can do to alleviate or ameliorate that threat. So a lion's fighting another lion and the lion can't run away, but they can't because they're too injured and they can't fight because the other lion's too big. They will lie down on their backs in a prone position. This is the freeze response, where now the autonomic nervous system shuts down. We go to a freeze and we now completely submit 
and this could be a state where the lion lying down and animals do it and so do we, <clears throat> is like, okay, I can't hurt you from here, on my back with my paws up, I can't hurt you, and I'm ready to die. If the threat is so great, at that point, it's like, I'm not going to protect my vital organs, here's my throat, here's my vital organs. Now, in humans, what happens when we are in that much threat, under, under that much, like, it is impossible to escape. Often people, having worked a lot as a psychologist in Australia, in prisons and homeless shelters, etc., having worked with a lot of people who have been traumatised, they will describe an experience of, it felt surreal. It felt like I was, it was an out-of-body experience, or everything slowed down, I was calm, I completely submitted. Um, it wasn't happening to me, it was like I was in a dream or a film. And I've heard lots of people talk in that way. This is where psychologically, consciously, we disassociate from reality because reality is too damn frightening. It's too damn scary to countenance and it's outside of our frame of reference. We don't understand, we're going to die. And that's when people will go to a trauma response, okay? This is a... This is an acute stress response, but, but if that threat became so great that there was a thought, I can't survive this, some of us might have gone into a trauma response. And that is a, it's called a dissociation. And it's a, it's a very difficult place to come back from without accepting that it's happened. And the thing I want to say is, the most important thing in all the work I've done is to normalise this. And just say, there is nothing weak about this response. It's actually a normal response by a normal person to an abnormal situation. And I think the last two years we could say was an abnormal situation. If we take normal as expected and predictable, well, I don't think this has been either of those two things. So this has been abnormal. So there's a lot of people, particularly those who have been strong, and feel that they are being weak by feeling anything but confident or optimistic. Give yourself a break here. You know, this is, this is what happens. A lot of strong people don't accept their own uh, anxiety. A lot of sensitive people might be more prone. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of personality indices that means that everybody is different in our response. So please don't ever compare yourself to another in terms of your responses to threat, because we're all built differently. We all have different temperaments, different childhoods, different upbringings, different sensitivities. So, no comparisons, first and foremost. And when I've run groups on anxiety and anger and, and all sorts of things, it's one of the rules. You can compare yourself to yourself, but you can't compare yourself to others. That's ridiculous. It's like me comparing myself to a, you know, a basketballer. I'm just simply not tall enough, and that's the way I'm built. Okay, so uh, hopefully that makes a bit of sense. I know it's a quick version, but that is essentially, and this is, you can't turn this off and you can't turn it on. It's automatic, which is why it's called the autonomic nervous system, automatic autonomic. And we've all got one. Animals have got one. We've got one. We're animals. The only difference is we can talk about it. And this is the key. Okay, cheers.